um, as you were been informed, uh, C-SPAN is filming this, uh, which is good news, I think, for the uh, C-SPAN watchers. <laughs> <laughs> Probably better news than it is for you here. Um, I think, uh, considering the makeup of the present Congress, um, <laughs> this will be a refreshing change for them. <laughs> so, um, I cannot think of a less competitive situation. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, I'm not going to actually uh, give a speech um, because you have to write a speech um, <laughs> or you have to be a senator. Um, I am neither. I am uh, too lazy to be the first and too honest to be the second. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, read a little bit from um, this book, um, which is called The Friendly Butts Reader, which is, uh, includes, um, it's not actually an anthology, um, it's actually everything I ever wrote. Um, <laughs> it's more of an encyclopedia. Uh, I, I wanted to call it the Friendly Woods Encyclopedia, but they decided to call it the Friendly Woods Reader, I guess, to distinguish it from the Friendly Woods Writer. Uh, so I'm going to read a little bit from this, and then I'm going to answer questions from the audience in an entertaining fashion. Um, you don't have to ask them in an entertaining fashion. Um, you do have to speak up, though, apparently. Now, I'm, usually I'm not, but I'm kind of afraid to touch this. I'm going to be touching this now. Okay. Um, usually at the Y, I'm not the shortest person. Um. <laughs> now that this book is in a different order, I don't know where everything is anymore, so you'll have to kind of, uh, let's see, bear with me. Uh, this piece that I'm going to read now is, is called... Um, a diary of a New York apartment hunter. Uh, it's uh, slightly dated, uh, so I'll just uh, jack up the prices by about 50 times. And, <laughs> and um, I sometimes, I, I often read this in New York, um, but I sometimes read it outside of New York where it's generally uh, perceived as science fiction. <laughs> Here you'll realize that it's understated. Friday. Awakened to the crack of dawn by a messenger bearing this coming Sunday's New York Times real estate section. First six apartments gone already. Spent, an additional, spent a good 15 minutes dividing the number of New York Times editors into the probable number of people looking for two bedroom apartments. Spent additional half hour wondering how anyone who has a paper to get out every day could possibly have time to keep up 1,100 friendships. Realize this theory not plausible and decided instead that the typesetters all live in co-ops who are burning fireplaces. Wondered briefly why listings always specify wood-burning fireplaces. Decided that considering the prices they're asking, it's probably just a warning device for those who might otherwise figure what the hell and just burn money. <laughs> Called VF and inquired politely as to whether anyone in his extremely desirable building had died during the night. Reply in the negative. I just don't get it. It's quite a large building, and no one in it has died for months. In my tiny little building, they're dropping like flies. Made a note to investigate the possibility that high ceilings and decorative moldings prolong life. Momentarily chilled by the thought that someone who lives in a worse building than mine is waiting for me to die. <laughs> Cheered immeasurably by realization that A, nobody lives in a worse building than mine, and B, particularly those who are waiting for me to die. Saturday, uptown to look a co-op in venerable midtown building. Met real estate broker in lobby, a Caucasian version of Tokyo Rose. She immediately launched into a description of all the respectably employed people who were waiting in line for this apartment. Showed me living room first. Large, airy, terrific view of well-known discount drugstore. <laughs> Two bedrooms, sure enough. Kitchen, sort of. When I asked why the present occupant had seen fit to cut three five-foot high arches out of the inside wall of the master bedroom, she muttered something about cross-ventilation. When I pointed out that there were no windows in the opposite wall, she ostentatiously extracted a sheaf of papers from her briefcase and studied them closely. Presumably, these contained the names of all the Supreme Court justices who were waiting for this apartment. 
Nevertheless, I pressed on and asked her what one might do with three five-foot high arches in one's bedroom wall. She suggested stained glass. I suggested pews in the living room and services on Sunday. She showed me to a room she referred to as the master bath. I asked her where the slaves bathed. <laughs> she rustled her papers ominously and showed me the living room again. I looked disgruntled. She brightened and showed me something called a fun bathroom. It had been covered in fabric from floor to ceiling by someone who obviously was not afraid to mix patterns. <laughs> I informed her unceremoniously that I never again wanted to be shown a fun bathroom. <laughs> I don't want to have fun in the bathroom. I just want to bathe my slaves. <laughs> she showed me the living room again. Either she just couldn't get enough of that discount drugstore, or she was trying to trick me into thinking there were three living rooms. <laughs> Impudently, I asked her where one ate, seeing as I had not been shown a dining room, and the kitchen was approximately the size of a brandy snifter. <laughs> well, she said, some people use a second bedroom as a dining room. I replied that I needed the second bedroom to write in. This was a mistake, because it reminded her of all the ambassadors to the UN on her list of prospective tenants. <laughs> well, she said, the master bedroom is rather large. Listen, I said, I already eat on my bed. In a one-room, rent-controlled slum apartment, I'll eat on the bed. In an innately priced, high-maintenance co-op, I want to eat at a table. <laughs> call me silly, call me foolish, but that's the kind of girl I am. <clears throat> she escorted me out of the apartment and left me standing in the lobby as she hurried off, anxious no doubt, to call Henry Kissinger <laughs> and tell him, okay, the apartment was his. <laughs> Sunday spent the entire day recovering from a telephone call with the real estate broker, who, in response to my having expressed displeasure at having been shown an apartment in which the closest thing to a closet had been the living room, said, well, Fran, what do you expect for 3,500 a month? <laughs> he hung up before I could tell him that actually, to tell you the truth, for 3,500 a month, I expended the Winter Palace. <laughs> Furnished. Not to mention fully staffed. Monday. Look this morning at the top floor of the building, which I have privately christened Uncle Tom's Brownstone. <laughs> One end of the floor slopes sufficiently for me to be able to straighten up <laughs> and ask why the refrigerator was in the living room. I was promptly put in my place by the owner who looked me straight in the eye and said, because it doesn't fit in the kitchen. <laughs> True, I conceded, taking a closer look, that is a problem. I'll tell you what though, and this may not have occurred to you, but that kitchen does fit in the refrigerator. <laughs> Why don't you try it? I left before he could act on my suggestion and repaired to a phone booth. Mortality rate in VF's building, still amazingly low. <laughs> Called about apartment list in today's paper. Was told fixture fee, $100,000. Replied that unless Rembrandt had doodled on the walls, $100,000 wasn't a fixture fee, it was war reparations. Tuesday, let desperation get the best of me and went to see an apartment described as interesting. <laughs> interesting generally means that it has a skylight, no elevator, and they'll throw in those little bottles for free. This one was even more interesting than usual because the broker informed me Jack Kerouac had once lived here. Someone's pulling your leg, I told him. Jack Kerouac's still living here. <laughs> Wednesday, ran into a casual acquaintance on 7th Avenue. Turns out he too is looking for a two bedroom apartment. We compared notes. Did you see the one with the refrigerator in the living room, he asked. <laughs> yes, indeed, I said. Well, he said, today I looked at a dentist's office in the East 50s. A dentist's office, I said. Was the chair still there? No, he replied, but there was a sink in every room. <laughs> it sounded like a deal for someone. <laughs> Called real estate broker and acquired as the price of newly advertised co-op. Amount in substantial six figures. 
What about financing, I asked. Financing? She shuddered audibly. This is an all-cash building. I told her that to me, an all-cash building is what you put on Boardwalk or Park Place. <laughs> she suggested that I look further uptown. I replied that if I looked any further uptown, I'd have to take karate lessons. <laughs> she thought that sounded like a good idea. Thursday. Was shown co-op apartment of recently deceased actor. By now so seasoned that I didn't bat an eye at the sink in the master bedroom. Assumed that either he was a dentist on the side <laughs> or that it didn't fit in the bathroom. <laughs> Second assumption proved correct. <laughs> Couldn't understand why though. You think that there not being a shower in there would have left plenty of room for a sink. <laughs> Real estate broker pointed out recent improvements. Tangerine colored kitchen appliances, bronze mirrored fireplace, a fun living room. <laughs> Told the broker that what with the asking price, the maintenance, and the cost of unimproving, I couldn't afford to live there and still wear shoes on a regular basis. <laughs> Called VF again. First the good news. A woman in his building died. Then the bad news. She decided not to move. <laughs> Thank you.